Okay, thank you very much. I'll uh, hand over the time to Dr. <laughs> Net Brandon Thanks very much, um, Ryan, and good morning to um, our distinguished guests uh, and our online and in-person uh, participants uh, today. Um, a very warm welcome to session one of the Promoting Cybersecurity Sector Diversity and Bilateral Interdisciplinary uh, Research Workshop today. Our session one is entitled National Security and Cyber Policies for Enhancing Regional Cybersecurity Capabilities, Emerging Challenges and Key Issues. Our discussion today is hosted by UQ Cyber and Korea University and was made possible with the funding support of the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trades, Australia Korea Foundation Grants Program. My name is Greta Nabs Keller. I'm a senior specialist in defence research at the University of Queensland's Engineering, Architecture and Information Technology Faculty. And I'm also a senior research affiliate at UQ Centre for Policy Futures, where my research focuses on Indonesian security development and foreign policy issues within the context of broader strategic change in the Indo-Pacific region. Before introducing my guest panellists today, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands in which we meet today, the Yagara and Turabal people. On behalf of UQ, I pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise the valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I'm very excited to be hosting such a talented um, and experienced panel this morning, and I'd like to introduce them to our audience, noting the importance of enhancing bilateral Australia-Korea cybersecurity cooperation as two like-minded middle powers in the Indo-Pacific region, which are both facing a broad range of cyber challenges and opportunities um, in the cyber domain. Our panellists will each present for 15 minutes before we turn to Q&A discussion, and I'd like to now introduce them in turn. Firstly, I'd like to welcome uh, Director Onsu Jo, uh, who's the Director of Cybersecurity and the Network Policy Bureau of the Cybersecurity Industry Division of the Ministry of Science and Information Communications Technology, Republic of Korea. Dr. Uh, Director Jung has worked for 14 years at SK Telecom, Korea's largest mobile network operator, and SK, SK Planet. In 2019, he moved to the Ministry of Science and ICT, and he is head of the Cybersecurity Industry Division, which is in charge of fostering the cybersecurity industry. Director Jung received the, his bachelor's degree in electronic engineering from Hanyang University, a master's degree in information and communications engineering from Sejong University, and a doctoral degree from Korea University School of Cybersecurity. So, a warm welcome to Director Jung this morning. I'd like to now turn to our next panelist, uh, Professor Jong In Lim, who is a leading expert in cybersecurity in Korea. She is former special advisor to the president for national security and participates in a number of advisory roles for the Korean government. Currently, Professor Lim is professor of the Graduate School of Information Security at Korea University, which he founded in 2000. He received a Bachelor of Science, a Master of Science and PhD degrees, PhD degrees in the Department of Mathematics at Korea University, Seoul. In 1986, he joined Korea University as a professor. Professor Lim is a chairman of the Digital Forensic Advisory Committee for the Supreme Prosecutor's Office and the Committee of Security Technology of Financial Security Agency. He was also a former president of the Korea Institute of Information Security and Cryptography and a member of the Personal Information Protection Commission under the direct jurisdiction of the president. Professor Lim was the inaugural recipient of the Presidential Medal of Honor for Cybersecurity in 2012. A warm welcome to Professor Lim. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. So Jong Kim, who is the Director of the Cybersecurity Policy Research Department of the National Security Research Institute. Dr. Kim has worked in the uh, NSR uh, since 2004, and her primary research focus includes cybersecurity strategy, policies, and the international security of cyberspace. Dr. So Jin Kim got her degree at the Graduate School of Information Security of Korea University in 2005 
with the theme of a study of personal information protection in the public sector with the implementation of privacy impact assessments. She has been involved in drafting the National Cybersecurity Strategy of Korea, which was published in April 2019, and has also participated at the fourth and fifth UN uh, governmental group of experts process as an advisor. In addition, she has participated in the 2013 Seoul Cyberspace Conference, uh, Meridian Process, and several bilateral, trilateral, and multilateral cybersecurity policy consultations and dialogues. The NSR has been has hosted the International Conference on Cybersecurity Policy and Strategy, the GCPR, Global Conference on Peace Regime, since 2014. Her main research areas are various policy issues regarding national cybersecurity policy, such as international norm setting processes, confidence building message, uh, measures, I apologise, CIIP, law and regulations, cybersecurity evaluation methodology development and comparison. So a warm welcome to Dr Kim as well. I'd like to turn to our fourth panellist now, uh, Ms Michelle Mosey, who's the Chief Operating Officer and US Lead for OSCYBER, the Cyber Growth Network, focused on growing Australian cybersecurity startups and assisting to launch Australian businesses globally. Michelle's career has focused on national security elements in intelligence and security, with a strong focus on emerging technologies, cyber security, information policy, and multinational relationships. During 2018 to 2020, Michelle was the head of strategic partnerships and engagement in North America at With You With Me and the global head of academy for With You With Me, working with US military veterans to train in high tech careers. Michelle joined the Australian National University in 2017 as a senior advisor of cybersecurity and worked in the establishment of the ANU Cyber Institute. She's led development programs focused on talent strategies for cyber professionals, working closely with Australian universities to support STEM, talent development, and intern opportunities. Michelle has directed a range of intelligence and security engagements across the defence portfolio, Australian defence industry, and international partners to support policy development information agreement, strategic planning, training and awareness. During 2009 to 2012, Michelle served in Washington as the Australian Intelligence Liaison to the Under Secretary of Defence Intelligence, providing the Australian perspectives to shape and contribute to Australia-US intelligence and security relations. Michelle has also served as Chief of Staff to the Australian Deputy Secretary of Intelligence and Security, assisting to align intelligence organisational outcomes to Australian strategic outcomes. She joined the public service in 2002 after a 13-year career with the Royal Australian Navy. So a warm welcome to you, Michelle. Um, I'm going to turn firstly to Director Unsu Jung, because I've been made aware that uh, Dr Jung and, and others are dealing with a major internet outage uh, that uh, Korea has experienced in the last uh, several days. So I would ask uh, Director Jung to speak firstly, and the floor is yours, Director Jung. Please go ahead. Thank you, Coretta. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eun Su Jung. I'm a Director of Cybersecurity Industry Division in the Ministry of Science and ICT of the Republic of Korea. I would like to introduce our new national cybersecurity strategy, which we have announced in February this year. As we are trying to get ready for environmental changes, such as digital transformation and face-to-face -face working environment. It wouldn't be much of an entertainment since it is government policy. So I want to take a little patience. First of I'm going to talk about the present state of Korean cybersecurity and followed by the background of the strategy and next the key tasks we are setting forward. On this page, uh, we will introduce the current state of cybersecurity in Korea. Cyber incidents like ransomware, smithing, DDoS, has dramatically increased in Korea after COVID-19 is started. The number shows two and a half times than the previous year. We are always trying to respond to cyber threat in a timely manner, and the scale of our domestic cybersecurity market is also increasing. 
In June this year, Korea took the first position out of 194 countries in the Global Cybersecurity Index report announced by International Telecommunications Union. Our previous rank was 15th in the previous iteration. We are reading the emerging network environment as a 5G was first launched in Korea and trying to maintain safe digital environment as well. Next is on the background of the strategy. First, cybersecurity paradigm shift. If digital services are expanding in our daily lives, in our economy, in our society, cyber threat no longer has its boundaries and the number of points of protection is getting larger and larger and its scale as well. So far, the cyber threat were managed to be resolved if our security specialists use their medicine in the place and point is hair and hand, those threats became real. Now we can see those cyber threats anytime, anywhere. With the limited resource of cyber security professionals, we cannot effectively can control all those cyber threats. Incident response approach with security professional is showing its limitation in the new digital economy era. The globe requires fundamental change of cybersecurity paradigm. Korea has set up a new national cybersecurity strategy in order to respond to cybersecurity paradigm shift by the digital transformation. Our strategy set its vision to realize world's best digital safe and reliable country. Now, I would like to introduce our key task set in the national cybersecurity strategy. First one is to modernize our cybersecurity response system. We are going to continue to support security vulnerability management framework in order to keep our daily capacity in a high state. Collected vulnerabilities are sharing with companies and all population. And security patches are developed and distributed. We also monitor more than 20,000 influential websites that have a highest access rate for each preemptive malware detection and the defacement. In order to support relevant companies are able to respond in a timely manner. To keep the information sharing framework low, we are going to launch Cybersecurity Alliance with including, but not limited to managed the security service providers and cloud providers. We also plan to execute cybersecurity drills on a regular basis in order to encourage cyber response capability development for private sector in voluntary basis. The second key task is consumer-oriented digital security capacity building. We will support ongoing digital transformation process in private companies including small and medium enterprises. By directly supporting expense for solutions required to implement non-face-to-face services. After selection process on the major software providers, we will support the security assessment for every phase of the designing, implementation, and distribution of the software and services, and the measures as well. To support secure software development and its supply chain security, we will continue to support providing assignment tools for software stability and tools for supply chain security. Customized support will be expanded as well, considering companies' different sizes and types. 
to small and medium enterprises who are, who are interested in cybersecurity but lack of investment power, we will support them by inviting customized security consultation and adaptation of security solutions. For entire population, we will expand remote security assessment services, such as PCs and IoT devices, in order to create a digital safe environment. We will execute more security assessment on amend services, non-face-to-face solutions, and mobile applications that many people are using and create a digitally safe environment that the entire population can safely use. Our key task number three is about building the next generation convergence security infrastructure. Regarding convergence industry, like smart factory and autonomous vehicle, we will strengthen in security capacity by setting up the own process, which can be represented by security guidelines, proof of concept, standard model, and regulations. And for this, we'll have a convergence security association with relevant ministries participated. Also, we are preparing a, a common guideline for convergence security to be applied to smart factory, autonomous vehicle, and smart medical service. For cloud service, 5G mobile edge computing, which will be the key infrastructure for convergence industry. We will try to build a security infrastructure in a preemptive way. So the vulnerability assessment and consultation for cloud service provider will be supported and expanded. And the cyber attack monitoring system for the 5G mobile edge computing will be implemented, as well as research and development on post-quantum cryptography. Key task number four is about AI black response to emerging security threat. We will support companies uh, preventing new security threat access to local and international by distributing prevention and response guidelines. This year, we had continu continuous missing campaigns leveraging COVID-19 so that we will prepare a program that can block the phone number used by those threats. AI technology will be used to develop to predict cyber attacks so that the AI security platform will be implemented in order to raise analysis capability. The security industry keeps demanding security threat data set to improve their product and for their new technology development. Corresponding to this, our government is going to open our security data set to companies through the platform for their security products and service development. These data set will be analyzed and processed to be used in learning data. Key task number five is about securing core technology for digital security. Contact this technology, remote authentication, next generation physical security, AI backed cyber attack response. For this security technology, we will invest more money than before, about 84 million US dollar until year 2023. And onto the data protection framework as well. Also, we are going to support technology development for privacy protection using AI and the identification and the combined information processing with the purpose of the risk exposure of personal information and promoting its usage at the same time. And the R&D on isomorphic encryption that the data are usable without a decryption process. 
we are going to teach you next generation combustion skill technology and we are going to secure skill technology for key infrastructure like cloud and 5G IT network and also technology for response against AI based machine hackers and quad technology for AI based security. We will secure 5G and AI technology and expand the, the joint international R&D activities for global technology cooperation. The last one, number six, is about supporting cybersecurity industry growth. We plan to support promising companies who have comparability of power on AI and non paced face security technology until two, 2023, not only supporting their growth, but also exporting the product to global market. COVID-19 has brought many obstacles also to our local security vendors. When they try to go abroad, so we are gonna uh, make our Korean portfolio as one brand to export our product and support modular export assistance considering the target country's characteristics and demands. And the case secret digital exhibition will help export assistance for our secret vendors by webinar, AR, VR Expo, online seller via meeting, etc. Today, the digital transformation is accelerating and this makes ICT manpower shortage by the platform companies and game developer in particular. In Korea, we expect annual shortage of 2,000 cybersecurity professionals. So we are planning to post innovative talent on digital security by expanding universities and graduate school on cybersecurity with a specialty on new digital convergence industry, AI security technology, et cetera. We plan to build up online cyber incident response training platform that provide hand-on educational content and virtual content. And today, I have shown you to introduce our new rational cybersecurity strategy as we were trying to get ready for environmental changes such as digital transformation and face-to-face -to -face working environment. Thank you for listening for my presentation. Uh, so I'm sorry, I have another meeting schedule. Uh, I don't have enough time to answer your questions. If you have any question about my presentation, uh, feel free to ask Korea University by email. We'll answer them later. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Director. Uh, Doom, um, and we are very mindful that you have other obligations, and I'm sure our audience uh, notes uh, the very comprehensive nature of uh, Korea's new national security, national cyber security uh, strategy, and we can pick up some of the threads of, of, of that presentation in our Q&A later. Uh, now, I'd like to turn to Professor Lim
morning. Please go ahead, no. Professor Lim. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Greta. Uh, I am professor of Dominion of Korea University School of Cybersecurity. Today, uh, I will explain some current landscape of both Korea cybersecurity and some proposals for cooperation between two countries and two universities. As you know, Korea is one of the most wired countries in the world and uh, we have suffered major cyber incidents for the last three, 12 years. To cite a few uh, major incidents, 2009, we have suffered a massive nationwide DDoS attack. So our uh, internet service was shut down. 2011, our uh, NH Bank cyber attack. NH Bank, one of the best, one of the most largest uh, commercial bank, uh, it was hit by North Korea and internet, internet service and bank service was shut down for a few hours. There was a cyber attack to Korea nuclear power plant. So uh, people feared some Fukushima-like uh, some incident. And three years ago, there was a Pyeongchang Winter Olympic game. Uh, there was a cyber attack uh, from outsider. First time, uh, firstly, we saw it was from North Korea, but it was turned out uh, it was from Russia. We, South Korea, was uh, surrounded by major cyber power, China, North Korea, and Russia. With this uh, major incident, we, Korean government, uh, have made some nation level uh, and especially our uh, cybersecurity policy. Uh, originally, it was uh, focused on technical side and ministerial side. Uh, so 2009, National Cyber Crisis Comprehensive Countermeasure, uh, it was, uh, there was a DDoS shelter on TISA and some uh, nation cyber threat response system. After 2011 NH Bank cyber attack, it was expanded and amended uh, some governance, uh, governance setting and eliminate cross-border issue between government agency. After 2013 KBS broadcasting uh, incident, we, we, we saw we, uh, some uh, shortage of cycle of workforce. So we, as Dr. Jung said, we focused on raising cyber workforce and professional and uh, some governance, governance and security market industry raising and some system, information sharing system, CTAS. And 2015, our national cybersecurity portfolio and capability strength plan was made and some uh, expansion between government side and uh, private side. And finally, after Pyeongchang Olympic incident, uh, nation cyber strategy or security strategy and NCSS basic plan was made. 2019, uh, uh, April, uh, Blue House made first national cybersecurity strategy. Uh, this strategy, uh, first national cybersecurity strategy, made vision, goal, basic principle, and strategic task. Vision is to create free and safe cyberspace to support national security, promote 
of economic prosperity and contributes to international peace. Goal consists of three goals. Ensure stable operation of the state, especially core infrastructure protection is essential. Secondly, respond to cyber attack from outside. So, build a strong cybersecurity foundation, fair and autonomous ecosystem where cybersecurity technology, human resource, and industry are compatible. Then, in, uh, in five months ago, uh, five months later, a basic principle was made of uh, balance individual rights with cybersecurity, made a strike of balance between protecting cyberspace and safeguarding the fundamental rights of people, digital privacy, balance between cybersecurity and digital privacy and conduct security activity based on rule of law. That uh, current government cybersecurity policy and activity in transparent manner and uh, compliance with the domestic act and international law. So build a system of participants and cooperation, encourage individuals, business, government to participate in cybersecurity activity and pursue close relationship with international community. Strategic task consists of six tasks. First, increase the safety of national core infrastructure. Secondly, enhance cyber attack response capability. Third, establish government based on trust and cooperation. Fourth, build foundation for cybersecurity industry growth. It foster uh, cybersecurity culture and lastly, with international cooperation in cybersecurity. In September, same year, a uh, basic plan for implementing uh, was made. A uh, sixth strategic goal and task, it consists of six goals and tasks, enhance uh, stability of critical infrastructure and enhance cyber attack response capability. Building or cyber deterrence strengthen readiness condition for large scale cyber attack or take comprehensive and active measures and enhancing cyber crime response capability or establishing governance based on trust and cooperation. Foundation for growth of the cyber security industry uh, settlement of cybersecurity culture, leading international cybersecurity, materialize cyber military collaboration between United States and Korea, and participate in Asian Defense Ministers' meeting. Korea uh, cyber power is uh, two sides. Uh, first, uh, Source is ITU uh, left side of uh, Korea cybersecurity readiness regarded as mature, uh, ranked as first. But uh, Korea response capability, such as cyber resilience, just in the middle, much needed, insufficient. So, we, are, uh, so we need to endeavor. Uh, as I said, uh, as I said, Korea is surrounded by major cyber power, China, North Korea, and Russia. These days, uh, uh, for the last 12 years, we have suffered, and this year, uh, most uh, attack from China. Since Trump, uh, Trump uh, prohibited transfer of cutting edge technology and tension between United States and China rising. Uh, China attack for conventional uh, intelligence stealing, not, not only intelligence stealing, but also cutting edge technology and human resource. So uh, this shows 
uh, number one attacker is China, both China. And uh, this is sources Arope Cyber Command, military side, and this is from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, most uh, number one attacker is also China. We are not sure uh, this is just IP address. So we are not sure this is origin or just pass over, pass through, but uh, China is the main opponent in cyberspace uh, from Korea perspective. As I said, uh, these days China is focusing on stealing cutting edge technology and uh, critical infrastructure vulnerability. So uh, China is attempting to steal cutting edge technology uh, such as semiconductor, autonomous driving technology, display technology, or OLED. And uh, this shows country behind the intellectual property leakage of Korea, number one is China. As also, uh, these days, the, the most uh, concern uh, in cybersecurity is ransomware, global, global concern. Uh, we also suffer uh, ransomware damage. Uh, this this is the uh, Korean company, ransomware uh, damage, amount of damage very increased, increased very rapidly. But this is just reported damage. We, so we uh, assume uh, unreported damage is much higher. Uh, and uh, most ransom comes from North Korea, Russia, and China also. These days, uh, North Korea not only is killing uh, intelligence, intelligence uh, hacking, uh, but also they hacking by they hacking to monetary purpose. So they use <coughs> less error with Russia hacker. So uh, we suffer very much by less error. Uh, also, a uh, continued cyber threat from North Korea. This year, North Korea hacker targets South Korea nuclear think tank. Also, uh, they try to attempt, uh, they try to hacking attempt uh, against aircraft manufacturer Kai. Also, a uh, key defense form was hacked by North Korea. Uh, and so National University was also hacked. Uh, supply chain security, cyber security is a big issue. We also, uh, last year, our uh, solar energy hacking was a global issue, especially in United States. So President Biden emphasized uh, supply chain security and ransomware. Uh, we also support uh, supply chain security. A few years ago, 5G security issue with Huawei also uh, was a big issue in Korea. Uh, this is the source, this uh, Cisco, uh, 5G security issue and supply chain security. Uh, because of uh, secret supply chain security issue and concern, uh, Huawei, uh, the most competitive uh, equipment supplier, uh, is almost uh, wiped out in South Korea market. And uh, also, CCTV, made in China, CCTV is very competitive in price. So, they are dominant supplier of CCTV in South Korea too. But uh, we discovered some backdoor in Chinese CCTV. So uh, they, uh, were, they were uh, expelled from uh, 
South Korea market in business market. Also, uh, secure AI, you know, as you know, AI is a game changer, but uh, how to make AI secure and trustworthy? This is a big issue. Uh, this is a, uh, some slide, this slide shows some uh, weak points of AI and how to make AI trustworthy. This is a very, uh, uh, future, a uh, future research area. How to count measure, how to make uh, uh, build cooperation between Korea and Australia. Strengthen our uh, national cybersecurity capacity and import, uh, international cooperation. I think a uh, possible measure of Korea-Australia cooperation Multilateral side, or uh, this shows existing cooperation, UNGG and United States based approaches. But our uh, possible model of cooperation is uh, something like Cold War Opus model. This uh, that can be applied to cyber area. So uh, we want for uh, cyber Cold or cyber Opus model. Uh, Cyber Alliance between two countries and or multilateral, including United States, Japan, and UK. Also, a uh, bilateral model or uh, high level cooperation and intermediate level cooperation, low level cooperation. Some uh, intermediate level, some combined military training and combined research and development. This, is, this, this cooperation can be applied to two universities. And uh, some information sharing, cyber defense hotline, confidence building events, something like this joint, this joint option. Possible bilateral cooperation between also uh, applies to countering ransomware this is, a, uh, as I said, is an urgent issue. So this, uh, we can uh, start from this topic. So, and this is a very good uh, topic. As a conclusion, uh, Korea and Australia are countries uh, that have ge geographical, political, and economic common interest in the pursuit of democracy and free trade. Uh, two countries have high national capability in terms of cyber security and a common cyber threat derived from China. So, uh, Korea, Australia need to promote regional cooperation model such as cyber code or open. And KU and UQ, Switzerland uh, will conduct educational research cooperation to develop specific policy measures and technical capability to contribute to cybersecurity cooperation between Korea and Australia and the cyber safety in this region. Educational research cooperation relates to resume response, AI security, and supply chain security can be a meaningful touch point for continuous cooperation between two universities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lim. Um, that was particularly interesting. You can pick up on, on some of the content of your presentation. I found the timeline of major cyber incidents and response really useful and the suite of policy responses to cyber incidents. Uh, some of the core um, strategic tasks of the national security strategy, and of course the international engagement and geopolitical dimensions of cyber security. So I'll move on to our uh, next uh, panelist now, um, Dr. So Jung Kim. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please, please proceed. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Jung Kim. Can you hear me? Hello. 
inviting me to this fabulous event with Australia. And it is also always a great honor to talk with my teacher, Professor Lin, at the same event. And uh, you were lucky to live this, so that it were not, you know, the order from the uh, record, John and Professor Lin, and from myself, uh, we were not actually talked before this event, but the, the order itself will be so wonderful. So, like the theme history shows how we see and the, the career sees the cybersecurity issues with the industry. And then Professor Lin talked about all the history and the, the what we need to be done, especially with the national strategy. And also he suggested some ideas on how we can uh, do something more in the future. So my presentation will be a one good example to what can be done together at the R&D sectors and also in multilateral, multilateral uh, cooperation, maybe we can use this as a starting point to talk about what can be the guideline or standard to to uh, international norms or just a common understanding. So let me start. Uh, before start, uh, I, I had uh, all of this is a talk is my personal capability, not the official one, and please keep in mind, and then uh, all materials are under review for the public uh, publications, so please do not use it or refer to it yet. So I want to let you know that the, the public official publication were done, and I want to let you know. And Greta said I've been worked at the National Security Research Institute since 2004. The NSR is government-funded R&D institution. Um, I'm leading policy department, and working on the national cybersecurity strategy development and legislative authority work and critical information infrastructure strength, uh, protections, etc. So our main research area have three categories. First is about the entity level cybersecurity enhancement measures. So which includes a revision of several legislation, the CIIP Act and the e-governance Act, from guidelines of minister of budget to make a legal basis for the budget spending for the information security purposes. The second area includes a more holistic and national security perspective. The cyber security became one part of national security issues and these days it's getting important. So with this, we have participated in several conferences in 2013 and took part in this 2019 national cyber security strategy publication. The thirdly, International security also encompasses the cybersecurity portions and the international norms that is in cyberspace for the main mission for more than 30 years in UN information security GDE. Still, there's no international laws having any legal authority. So, and still want to have CDM and specific norms in this field. So that's why I've been also involved in several UN GDE processes as an advisor. So now I'd like to start my presentation on the PESA and NRM report. So I want to talk about the background and overview, some attack, uh, the methodology itself, and national response metrics in Korea, and decision making process we need to change for the same for the work. So whenever any cyber attack occurs, we have to proportionate response, not only technical, but also political and strategic responses too. But however, we have no guidelines for the decision making. So our teammate said that the cyber attack severity assessment methodology and national response metrics to provide the basis for the decision making. So it took us four years to develop this and lead us to refine the national cyber security strategy. And we translated the Telemanual 2.0 in Korean. And then we could make our own punitive methodology, how seriously we study tactics from specific cyber attacks. So, Recently, cyber attacks led by the state and national background organizations have increased and are threatening national security. Looking at cyber operation, tech trackers, a national cyber accident DVD operator by the CFR, a think tank in the US, it can be seen as a state sparked 
this sponsored cyber attacks continue to increase. In particular, the number of attacks increased 2.5 times in 2020 compared to 2017. So in order to secure deterrence against the increase in numbers of state sponsors of cyber attacks, the need for active response at the national level is expanding. So accordingly, major countries have announced the offensive response met principles to cyber attacks and recommend major international organizations, including OECD and the EU, to respond professionally to malicious cyber attacks. The South Korea also expressed its willingness to secure deterrence against cyber attacks in 2019 strategy and prepare active countermeasures through the announcement of international cyber security strategy in 2019. However, there has been no additional publication since then. So that's why the NSR has tried to establish standards for determining whether a additional level of external response is necessary and to establish proportional response standards for imposing codes on attackers who conducted malicious cyber attacks. So in order to develop a cyber attack severity, um, we will look at the trends of the severity assessment methodology in the world. So they comprehensively examined the evolution of the cyber accidents in the IT and OT field and vulnerability evaluation and evaluation framework for diplomatic responses. So through that, the attack, attack target, attack capability, damage scale, and impact, and it can be seen that these three are the main factors for evaluating the severity of cyber attack. Among the five sub-items, the complexity of the attack, the effect on the function, and the influence of the information were selected as the most frequently evaluated items, indicating that they are essential items for severity evaluation. So using this methodology, we made the, the criteria for the evaluation, and we made some of our calculations and numbering methods, methods inside, and then we put it, we make a score for the how severe this impact is through our 27 cases analysis. So using this methodology, the severity of 20 cases, 27 cases of cyber attack in Korea was evaluated here. There were nine attacks with serious and high severity levels, as shown in the table, and the KH and P hacking and uh, March 20 cyber terror, and the Pyeongchang winter Olympic hacking in Korea cases. The most common cases were in the middle of the severity level, and the state sponsored espionage and high tech information, such as energy defense sector, secret killing continue to occur, and cyber attacks and their finance benefits have recently increased. So, most of the serious cases, 64% I should say, were supposedly originated from North Korea with open sources. In addition to North Korea, Russia and China were believed to be behind the, the attack. And very similar to Korea, the severity assessment showed that the needed severity level was 24 cases in 46 international segments between the incident cases in 2007. Actually, we analyzed 20, 27 Korean cases and 46 international cases to compare the how the score and the, the severity of these levels can be up, applied. So, So the video security and severity level was 24 cases, and the serious and urgent cases were six cases each. And all of which were presumed to be the work of the state or the national the state sponsored activities. So this can be said to indicate that cyber attacks are not as urgent and destructive as were through physical attacks, but are affecting national security through continuous and obstructive attacks. So the decision-making procedures is to propose a new appropriate response type by representing the metrics area and available countermeasures, including additional considerations in the metrics. So, so first of the step consideration in the decision-making procedure is the result of the severity evaluation using the severity evaluation methodology developed above. And second 
did this attack, that is who performed the attack. So it was divided into four categories, country, a state, or national state sponsored group, or individual or party group, or a non. And the third, the accuracy of attribution, defining the criteria in three ways, very accurate, highly accurate, and estimated. The imminence of the last attack was defined in two ways, imminent, imminent or not imminent. So imminent attack is aimed at considering this factor as it is difficult to determine whether cyber attacks are in progress or terminated. And if attacks in a similar purposes are repeated several times in the same country, the attack is fact accumulated and attack is imminent. Apply, applying cyber attack in Korea to the national response metric, it was found that the active external responses, including political, economic, and diplomatic responses, were needed for cases in the red zone and orange zone areas, where national background organizations are the main agents and can be attributed to the state. So we you you made we made this diagram when the attack was occurred. So we investigated and we evaluated the severity, and then we uh, used the six category classes of the uh, severity. Then you know, we based of very emergency or emergency cases and the medium low baseline cases. In that case, uh, we separated it as the, the, the attacker is the state state or state sponsored group or the individual private group. In, like that way, so we based the zone for six or nine areas to think, think, think it as a guideline for the response. So, use the, the deep response part, the state and the individual or group and country state if there has an amount of, it is about the attackers. And the, this, this is about the severity. So, from zero to five, so we can make it, we can calculate the cyber attack with the base, from baseline to the emergency. So when we affect, uh, put again, backward to our cases, so we thought in 2003, maybe we have the high severity, but in the actual response type can be half like this. So this can be done with these 27 cases in Korea. The CASA and the NRM will be revised to give a few guidelines for better determining in strategy level and evaluate the optimality and relevance and effectiveness of the, those methodologies. At least to suggest the government system collectively with the proper R&R among agencies. More so I can start to talk how we can make the CASA and NRM is a starting point to have a common guideline which can be used as a basis for the international norms and civilian settings. So it gives Korea a chance to not just taking part of an event, but also making content to contribute to human activities in offline and online at the same time. So in this regard, collaborative research with the QU, for example, will be a good source of regional cooperation in I quite well understand how Australia has been trying to work with ASEAN, ASEAN countries in the cybersecurity area and placing the US side, the EU, and the UK side as being the other. So, for the regional corporations, we need something concrete and specific to share. And uh, your work with the ARF and uh, from ASPI is the Australian think tank. Uh, cybersecurity capability assessment led by the Ministry of Public performed five and six years ago. And actually the NSR also redid the, our evaluation to the cybersecurity capability. So it's almost 10 years. And then we always compare the results of the ASPI and from the GPI. So we compare the how different, how the different criteria methodology and perspectives in, in to the different results in this way. So we also doing that one too. And also the Korea Development Institute of ROK has online courses with Australia for two times this year to want to raise awareness for the government officials from ASEAN countries. 
But those activities really have to fall for the common understanding in this region. So um, finally, I may uh, refer the Jotun Lai from the Harvard University said that we need to think of cybersecurity not with cold war version, but with the three dimensional angles of social, economic, and political. So we cannot solve transnational issues by ourselves. And so within Asia Pacific regions, RK and Australia, we're going to have a lot of chance to do more in the future. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kim, I think very interesting, uh, certainly around the need for standardised criteria and, and metrics for measuring uh, the severity of a cyber attack. And also note uh, the potential there for bilateral enhancing bilateral and multilateral cooperation. So we'll turn to our uh, fourth panellist, uh, Michelle Mosey now, and she'll present for 15 minutes and then we'll go to Q&A after Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Hang on, I'm on mute. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. I'm actually going to share my screen and uh, take you through some key points about off cyber. So thank you very much and certainly the opportunity to join you here today at the University of Queensland and Korea University in the Promoting Cybersecurity Sector Diversity and Bilateral Interdisciplinary Research event. Um, and a big thanks again to uh, Professor Ryan Koh and his team for the invitation. <clears throat> Our cyber, uh, I think it's a it's a good way for us to lean into um, an explanation about who we are and what we do. We're Michelle, actually a Michelle, public. Sorry yes. To just interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. Are you um, sharing a, a PowerPoint presentation there? Yeah. Because Can you see it? No. For some reason, not yet. looking uh, yes if you put that can on the you, can, can you see that now you can see that if you just put that on the full um screen that's right does that that's good thank you michelle all right fantastic uh, so let's get back to, into it. Um, Ocyber is a publicly funded private entity which commenced on the 1st of January in 2017. And one of the key missions that we were given by the Australian government is to grow Australia's cyber security sector in order to support the development of a vibrant and globally competitive Australian cyber security sector. So a number of our activities enhance Australia's future economic growth in a digitally enabled global, eco global economy and improve our sovereign cyber capabilities that are available to protect our nation's economy and community. Uh, we form part of the Australian government's industry growth centres initiative which was brought into being through the 2015 National Innovation and Science Agenda. And that was focused on sectors of competitive strength and strategic priority to Australia. Our funding in the majority comes from federal government grants. Um, and we have around about $15 million that we contribute to the OS Cyber Projects Fund. And that enables us to provide grants that deliver national benefits. So we work with Australian companies uh, to invest in capability and ideas that help those companies scale and grow throughout the domestic market that then gives them a strong domestic business and then enables them to prepare to go global. Now, we also have a number of agreements with uh, contracts 
with our state and territory governments. So for example, the ACT, New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia and Tasmania, uh, the Sunshine Coast Regional Council and Townsville City. And we match those elements um, and that supports OSCYBER's national network of cybersecurity innovation nodes, where we uh, work with local companies to enhance and elevate the activities that are going on within the local community. We also work to align and scale uh, Australian cybersecurity research and innovation related activities across the private sector. We work with research communities, academia and governments, as I've said before. <clears throat> We're actually also very, very invested in maintaining a strong supply of innovative Australian cybersecurity solutions and capability. And we've established ourselves through the last four and a half years of our lives as an independent advocate for the competitive and comparative advantages of Australian capability within the market. Um, beyond our shores, we work with many partners uh, within the Indo-Pacific region uh, to extend that capability and actually also offer, offer opportunities to grow within those areas. Um, it actually helps the rapidly growing Australian cybersecurity sector tap into those market hotspots around the world. <clears throat> so on the slide at the moment, you will see that Australia spends around $4 billion with an additional $1.3 billion over the next 10 years that is forecast to be spent on cybersecurity um, uh, expenditure. And within Australia at the moment, we've done a lot of work uh, mapping the numbers, talking to educational institutions and employers. And uh, the employment in Australia at the moment is around about 20,500 people. And we see that growing in, in the region of around about seven to 10,000 people within the next you know, five to 10 years. Uh, the sector within itself in Australia has the potential to almost triple in size in the coming years with the revenues, you know, to give you a bit of an idea, um, around about 2 billion in 2016 is where we started to around about 6 billion in 2026. And that is actually a massive gain, a 10X gain. Um, from a perspective of how we rank internationally, we're a second in the world for policies that support cybersecurity and allow government data to be openly available to the public. And that is proven through the work that uh, DFAT has done throughout um, the cyber ambassadors team uh, within DFAT, you know, Ambassador Fekin and the work that they've done through the Cyber and Critical Emerging Technologies Program. Um, Australia's cyber maturity is also the second highest within the Indo-Pacific, according to the annual survey conducted by ASPE. Um, we are a world leader in contributing to the input and the insights that we provide to not only uh, the World Economic Forum, but also many other forums, you know, throughout the, you know, the Australian and the international community, lending Australia's insight and experience to what it actually means to implement uh, strategies and uh, standards throughout the, you know, throughout the country. And uh, as you can see there, the final dot point, seventh most committed cybersecurity country according to the ITU's Global Cybersecurity Index. The uh, Australian Cybersecurity Strategy 2020, this was released around about August last year. And uh, Australia has actually a critical dependency in the digital domain and therefore on the trust and security of all digital activity. 
with the accelerated uptake of digital technologies in response to COVID-19 pandemic and the more day-to-day -day activities to moving online. We have needed to increase our focus on ensuring the digital environment is more secure, resilient and effective. Part of the cybersecurity strategy that was released saw that Australia will invest $1.67 billion over the next 10 years, building on the initial $230,000, which is invested in the 2016 cybersecurity strategy. Those elements are broken down into the following seven areas, protecting and actively defending critical infrastructure, including cybersecurity obligations for owners and operators. And this can actually be reflected in the cybersecurity and uh, infrastructure policy that has recently been released by the Australian government. We're also looking at new ways to investigate and shut down cybercrime. We're looking for those stronger defences for government networks and data programs across all of those elements, which include critical infrastructure. Um, part of uh, supporting those elements is the Joint Cybersecurity Centre Partnership Program, working very, very closely with industry to uh, increase reporting and collaboration of information at those uh, different levels across the market and sharing intelligence or sharing information. Um, part, of that, part of the investment uh, from the cybersecurity strategy will also go to advising small to medium enterprises to increase the cyber resilience. Because what we do understand in Australia is that it's not just up to government, it's not just up to industry, it's not just up to small to medium businesses, it's actually a whole team sport. And we talk about cyber actually being a team sport on a fairly regular basis. And the investment or, you know, the market in the sand by the Australian government to actually increase that cyber resilience is a huge uh, tick in the box to, to saying that um, it's actually everyone's job and cyber is a team sport. Um, we'll also be developing uh, guidance for securing Internet of Things. And uh, as part of the investment from that cybersecurity strategy, we'll be looking at 24 seven cybersecurity advice hotline for SMEs and families and uh, improving the overall community awareness for cybersecurity threats. Um, but what I did actually wanna take you through is a bit of a 2020 overview for the sector competitiveness plan and this is a report that OSCYBER pulls together from across the ecosystem in Australia. And uh, this will provide you a bit of an insight into the market in Australia. So around about 147 billion was spent on direct cyber products and services from a global perspective. Uh, the gross value added of Australia's sector is around about 2.3 million. Uh, within Australia itself, we have a need for 20, 26 and a half thousand workers at the moment. And that is looking to uh, rise by around about another 7,000 within the next five years, pushing that up over to 30,000 cybersecurity workers uh, required in Australia. Um, you know, there's some numbers around there about 43% of cybersecurity businesses are actually exporting globally in Australia. Um, and one figure that we are exceptionally proud of is that there are now 350 sovereign cybersecurity providers in Australia. When uh, OSCYBER started out in 2017, we were at 50. So within the last four years, we've actually managed to grow that from 50 to well over 350 sovereign providers. And that is something that we are exceptionally proud of. Um, to, you know, again, to give you a bit of an idea around the market, <clears throat> a 5.6 billion we spend as Australians within the market. Uh, providers 
within the Australian market generate around about 3.6 billion in revenue. Uh, 3 billion of that is from the domestic market with 600 million from the international market. And this will, you know, lead you to one of the key, I, the key elements that Cyber focuses on, which is global export to increase that 600 million to well overtake the domestic market. Um, you know, on to the next point. Most of the businesses in Australia uh, for cybersecurity, they're very, very young. We are a young market. We have lots of uh, entrepreneurs who are focused on the market, but the majority, they're less than five years old. Um, and 66% are less than 10 years old. That is a very, very young market particularly when you are looking at dealing with uh, many of the businesses who uh, focus coming out of the US and out of the UK. Um, Australians are fantastic at collaboration. So the conversation uh, today around Korea, Indo-Pacific, South Pacific, um, about how do we partner? How do we continue to increase the security of not only our nations, but how do we work together to do that? Australians are great partners and uh, we always look at those opportunities about where both sides can benefit, not only from a national security interest perspective, but also the perspective of um, bringing home some of the uh, benefits to each of the businesses. Um, and, uh, you know, COVID has been a very difficult time for all of us over the last 18 months. Um, and, you know, you can see there on one of the points that 51% of our businesses, um, they have been required to change the way they operate uh, because of COVID instances. Uh, the elements that we are focused on uh, for sustained growth, growth um, you know, we've got support Australia's digitising economy, uh, capture those global export opportunities. And that means working very, very closely with not only our allies, uh, throughout the Five Eyes partnership, but also those very, very close allies within the Indo-Pacific region uh, that we are closely aligned with, not only uh, geographically, but also within like minds and uh, politically in terms of the uh, comfort and support and security that we actually want to offer our um, citizens within each of our regions. Um, we want to be able to incentivize innovation and the capital flows. So what does that mean? That means actually industry and uh, universities working very, very closely together and looking at those hard challenges about the problems that we actually need to solve. Um, Number four is improving the market maturity and access. And again, that is not only about developing strong partnerships uh, with those within the region, but actually also starting to remove some of the procurement barriers that exist, not only internally to Australia, um, but actually putting some, some requirements uh, in place where strong and trusted partners um, are given not an exception to the rule, but certainly a different level of consideration because of the strong partnerships that we use when we work together. And of course, the big one that uh, I know we're going to talk a lot about tonight is uh, the development of skills in the future workforce. Of course, um, OSCYBER has done a lot of work in this space um, from everything to the uh, NICE uh, framework to the Skills Partnership for Innovation Fund, uh, which is supported by the Australian government. 
Um, we have developed a national curriculum at the vocational education level, which uh, supports those individuals who want to reskill, upskill, and get into the market. So it's a it's a huge challenge for every one of us within the market. Uh, just quickly moving through uh, some of Ostcyber's achievements uh, over the last four and a half years. Um, as I mentioned before, we're home to around 350 cybersecurity providers. 80% um, of those are actually headquartered in Victoria, New South Wales and the ACT. That should not be surprising. It is the east coast of Australia, so it actually is the closest to the uh, west coast of the US. Um, we, Ossiver itself has nodes in each of these areas. We have three nodes within Queensland, uh, within Brisbane, the uh, Sunshine Coast and also Townsville. Within New South Wales, we have an office in Sydney and uh, also Canberra. Um, Victoria, we work very, very closely with. Uh, we have a node within Tasmania. We have a node within South Australia. And uh, we have a node within uh, Western Australia with Edith Cowan University. Um, these, again, just provide you a bit of an overview of in terms of the provider's age, how long they've been operating in the space, what their priority areas are. Um, and of course, if you would like to delve into any more of this information, um, you can get that from the OSCYBER website at uh, www.oscyber.com and look for our sector competitiveness plan. Uh, I did just briefly want to delve into the cybersecurity skills shortage in Australia. Um, this is our forecast that was put out within the sector competitiveness plan. Uh, you can see, you know, 26 and a half thousand workers currently forecast growing to 33 and a half thousand uh, workers. And you can see there by, uh, you know, the, the orange that there is actually a significant deficit. And, uh, you know, I guess reflecting on many of the conversations that I've had with Professor Ko around how do we build the cybersecurity skills, it's actually all about diversity. It's actually all about looking at those workers who may have relevant skills in adjacent industries. Um, and, you know, for example, um, I have a deep and long history within the Australian military. And I work a lot with veterans, looking at veterans about the roles that they come out of um, after serving and how some of those skills can actually be applied to cybersecurity. So I think there are lots and lots of opportunities there for us to look at people who may not come from what we would deem the natural pipelines um, of talent that we would look at for cybersecurity. Because if there is anything about cyber that we know, it is ever evolving. And uh, we need to actually consider a lot of individuals who don't have um, the normal engineering skills that we have previously thought were critical to operating within this role. Um, of course, attracting talent, it's all about diversity, whether it is uh, gender, whether it is age, whether it is uh, background, whether it is educational, um, the more we open our eyes to the different talent that is actually available within the market and the problems that we need to solve within cybersecurity, uh, we will be better off. And there are lots and lots of actually good companies and programs out there at the moment that are actually looking at these opportunities. And, you know, a couple that I would mention, certainly one would be Humanico, uh, which actually looks at how do you build teams and what are their key skills 
um, that you can apply to the problems within your business. And of course, uh, With You With Me, which is a very focused veteran organization that looks at the kinds of skills that uh, veterans develop within service and can then be applied to not just cybersecurity, but also emerging technology problems. And, you know, the third one there before I finish off is retraining at speed. Um, <clears throat> the, the challenges that we have right now around the cybersecurity workforce, we can't afford to wait. Uh, we need to be able to train people quickly on the job, hands-on skills, uh, micro-credentialing, uh, for example, to get people in and uh, on the job quickly. Um, it's fantastic if you're able to spend, you know, three or four years to go to university and get those skills. But I think there are many, many pipelines that we actually need to consider and embrace in order to build the cybersecurity workforce. Uh, one of those is micro-credentialing. One of those is instituting uh, cybersecurity education from primary school through middle school up through high school. Um, another one is uh, vocational educational um, certifications and uh, enabling individuals to build the bricks that allow them to build their own pathway to a career in cybersecurity. And these days, a career in cybersecurity could mean everything from engineering, hands-on tools, hunting, all the way through to risk assessment, consultancy, and uh, business advisory services. It's no longer a hoodie in a dark room job. These are roles within cybersecurity that stretch across every element of your business. Uh, I will finish with that. Thank you uh, for your attention. Terrific, thank you. very much, Michelle. I think uh, what you've very ably uh, conveyed there is, as you said, it's a team sport and it's, it's, it's much more than just a, a government role, cybersecurity. You know, it's around entrepreneurialism, you know, innovation, uh, industry and universities uh, working together. And it, it's essentially a good news story that you presented on off cyber. I'm going to turn now to, to Q&A. We, we have limited time. But that was a, a good thing because of, of the richness of our um, panellists' presentations. I'd also note, uh, again, that our Director Unzu Dung has had to depart and leave us, uh, and that's he is making himself available to the to National Assemb Assembly and questions by senators uh, with respect to uh, internet uh, challenges uh, uh, going on in Korea at the moment. So without further ado, I'll, I'll open it to the floor. I think Professor Ryan Coe has a microphone there, and we might have some online questions as well. Thank you. And we'll have a look um, online for some questions. Any questions. And while we're waiting there, we have, uh, I'll proceed with, with some of the first questions. Um, I'd like to go back for a moment uh, to uh, Dr. Kim. Uh, Dr. Kim, can you hear us on the line still? You still with us, Dr. Kim? Professor Lim. What about Professor Lim on the line at the moment? Oh, yeah, it's muted. Oh, thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Lim. So we might um, start with uh, you there, Professor Lim. I mean, that was um, a very rich and detailed uh, presentation, as I mentioned before, around the six strategic tasks of the national. Uh, a cyber security strategy. And I noticed that you had a timeline around major cyber incidents and responses. And then at the end of the timeline, you had the national cyber security strategy uh, in 20, April 2019, I believe that was released. 
Could you tell us, Professor Lim, is that document a living document? Is that document, you know, being updated or does that get updated annually? Or, or could you explain a little bit more about the status of that document? Thank you. Yes, that, that document uh, updated is here and uh, in, in every five years. Document uh, updated in every five years. So every five years that's um, updated. Yeah, that's what Sojong Yim is saying what he says. Uh, can I explain a little bit more about this strategy? Actually, the 2019 strategy was the first one to publicize the national cybersecurity strategy in Korea. Before that, we have 2013, we had this strategy too, but it was closed. So it was not uh, possible to be to, to public. And before that, you know, 2009, 2011, we have also uh, some kind of um, public, public documents, but it is not the level of the strategy. So and the, the 2019 one was the first one to be publicized. So it will be, I hope, revised in next year or two years later, I guess. Yes, thank you. Any questions from the audience, our live audience at the moment? Okay, not yet. I'll just continue with a, a question, um, Dr. Kim, on for my curiosity more than anything about your national response matrix and your very detailed uh, criteria for security uh, severity assessments. Um, is this something that you've adopted and developed in collaboration with uh, counterparts in the United States? Or is this something that's very much evolving within uh, Korea itself around standardised uh, severity, uh, cyber attack severity assessments? Uh, actually, I had a close meeting with the US friends, of course, for the publications, and also I had a close meeting with the EU side uh, friends. It's just because of the time difference, I cannot do that at the same time. So we had two times of uh, close one, and also, uh, also um, I know that the Germany, Japan, and US is trying to having those kind of things in their own. So uh, next year, I will, you know, it is just supposed to have a meeting with them, actually, with ours. Yes, thank you. Um, and back to Professor Lin, if I may, before I move to Michelle. Professor Lin, you had some very practical suggestions there for enhancing cooperation between Australia and Korea. But you also mentioned about the cyber quad and the AUKUS model. And we know that the AUKUS, the Trilateral Security Partnership at present, involves Australia, the UK, and the US. Um, it, it may be expanded. I, I believe Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, said it may be expanded. I mean, how could you see Korea? Would you like to see more engagement of, of uh, partners like Korea in those quad and AUKUS kind of mechanisms for, for engagement and technology sharing? I think to make <coughs> cyber code or uh, uh, make uh, practical, uh, it is essential to build a uh, trust building and for, the, for that purpose, we have to uh, join workshop, uh, make joint workshop and uh, cyber workforce training uh, and R&D, common R&D. That's, that's the first step, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lim. Michelle, I'll turn to you uh, for, for a moment, um, if I may. Um, you, you, you talked about diversity and the importance of diversity, and I know we're picking up on diversity, I think, in our panel, our next session, um, 
after lunch. But um, it, it was an interesting comment you made because it reminds me of some conversations I've had with Ryan is that, you know, in our UQ Masters, we're, we're not just attracting engineers, we're attracting, you know, a really broad cohort, cohort of, uh, of, 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 of postgraduate students undertaking the Masters. I think comment on where you see diversity going in terms of uh, workforce skills development and prioritisation, both by offsider and, and government, attempts to promote this? Look, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I think that as we have developed as a cybersecurity profession, we've actually grown to understand and accept that uh, we need very, very different perspectives uh, within the cybersecurity profession to make us uh, successful. Um, there, are, there are lots and lots of stats that I could quote um, around the benefits of bringing women alone to an organisation um, because they come at it from a different perspective. They come at it with um, a different idea about risk. But it's not just the gender component. It's actually looking deeply within all of the resources we have within our region. And whether we're talking about Australia, whether we're talking about New Zealand, um, it's tapping into the veteran market. It's tapping into individuals who may have had long careers in Australia Post or, you know, pick any other, any other number of industries. I think it matters less about the industry that you've worked in and it matters more about how you think. Um, in order to, you know, really build out the cybersecurity profession, we need to be looking at individuals who are curious, individuals who like to problem solve, individuals who are good at communication, individuals who are you know, work well in a team environment. And if I had have just used those four elements and applied them to what we have previously known as cybersecurity professionals, they probably wouldn't quite match up. But the reason for that is, as we have become more knowledgeable about the types of skills that we actually require across small to medium enterprises and big business, um, we've, you know, we've actually come to terms with the fact that we need lots of different skills. And all of those skills don't rest within what we have previously identified as a cybersecurity professional. So I think it's, it's, it's as much about those of us who are in education, those of us who are in industry, those of us who are in recruitment, in big business, expanding our minds and saying, actually, the technical unicorn, who we used to think about before, um, is actually not always the person who's required. It's someone who works well within a team, who actually knows how to communicate the business issues from the technical level to the, to the, finance, the financiers and the decision makers within the organisation. And those people come in all different shapes, colours, sizes, backgrounds, ages, genders. Um, and I think, like, honestly, I think we're getting better at it, but we need to have it more forefront of mind than, uh, than ever before, because that's the only way we are going to solve the skills crisis, because it's not about training. It's not about people. We've got plenty of people. It's about us accepting those people into the profession. Okay, thanks, Michelle. We do have a, a I know we're running out of time, so I'll go to one question. Um, I think uh, because we, we need to finish, conclude around 12.30 uh, Brisbane time. Um, the question is, 
uh, around the strategy. So we, you, you covered Michelle Australia's Cybersecurity Strategy 2020. We've heard from our Korean panelists about Korea's Cybersecurity Strategy of April 2019. And the comment is the strategies all seem to embrace the exponential speed of tech technological growth like 5G, the Internet of Things, and connecting more critical infrastructure to the Internet uh, and appear to, to slap more money at the problem uh, that will pop up. Uh, should we take a step back and use policies to slow down the non-stop growth of technological abuse and connecting thing to things to the Internet? and focus on hygiene around supply chain privacy issues. So I guess that's really a question around should we use policy levers uh, to slow down some of this, this online uh, malicious behaviour and, and rapid technological advancement? Um, could I turn to you, Dr Kim, uh, firstly for an answer around that, please? Uh, thank you for the question. Maybe uh, yes, I can I can say uh, a little bit about the, the how we can manage the, the, the balance, the, how we can ma balance the, the, the speed and the, the IT utilization and the, the life itself and the privacy. So it is very difficult and uh, it depends on the environment the environment and then uh, it is also depends on the culture to the tendency of how we see the development of IT. So in Korean cases, you know, we more often, uh, often focus on the development and utilization first. So that's why you know, we are now in here. So in, in security and privacy issues, uh, always there's a, some big voices, voices to talk about we should we have to care about the privacy issues and then the ideas, other of course, policy issues, but still uh, and so it is not quite well uh, refined how we can manage that one. But in 2019 national strategy, we definitely mentioned that we were gonna do the balance with, between the national security and privacy issues and the development and the, the technology and other. Uh, but uh, other things at the same time. So I hope uh, that will be reflected in the, in the future processes for work in, in good ways, but still in, in um, academic perspective, you know, we understand and I very agree to the worries of the uh, delay along the development and then the policy issues. And also, I uh, also uh, should mention that the 2019 National Cybersecurity Strategy was published by the president, and then 2020 uh, Cybersecurity Strategy, which was explained in the earlier session, earlier uh, session of this panel, uh, was uh, made by the ICT Ministry. So, if we see the ICT Ministry Strategy, it is more um, focusing on the utilization, so maybe you can understand why you know the, the strategy itself is more focusing on the utilization because it is in entity itself to make for the ICT ministries and their main purpose is to utilizing and having good life with the development. So maybe you can understand in that way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Lim, I'll just give you a last comment before we're going to conclude. Now, did you have a last comment, um, Professor Lim? Thank you. As Dr. Sojong Lim mentioned, uh, the balance between uh, digital privacy, digital human rights, and technology is essential. So uh, that's why I emphasize secure AI and trust AI. Uh, uh, I think uh, this is the first step to collaborate between uh, Australia and Korea, Korea. And uh, in the afternoon session, we'll discuss details about uh, how to build up collaboration between two countries and two universities. Thank you for uh, Thank you. Thank you.
thank you, thank you, Professor Lim. I'm afraid we'll have to uh, conclude now. I'd like everyone to join me in thanking our four panelists uh, today: Professor Jong In Lim, Director Unsu Dung, uh, Dr. Su Dong Kim, and Michelle Mosey. My sincere appreciation uh, to you all for a fascinating uh, discussion today. Thank you very much. Concludes our uh, session one for today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm here to, to spread good news because it's lunchtime uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, at both campuses. So we will reconvene again uh, for the next session at 1 p.m. AEST and 12 p.m. Korean Standard Time. Okay, so. See you shortly. Please feel free to network with your peers during lunch and hope you enjoy the lunch. See you soon. <laughs>